short one. We're just going over one chapter today, uh, chapter six, and um, it's a straightforward chapter regarding uh, just a simple explanation on financial markets and institutions. Uh, we are a little bit ahead of schedule, and I think we'll just keep rolling with that. On Thursday, we will go into chapter seven, which is valuing bonds, and that'll just take, or sorry, on Wednesday's lecture, and I'll just take one lecture on Wednesday. Um, so yeah, two chapters this week, short ones, uh, pretty straightforward. And we will get started on chapter six, which is understanding financial markets and uh, institutions. Yeah, let's just making sure I'm recording here, sorry. Yes, okay. So what are financial markets? Um, you hear about the market if you watch business news, uh, if you happen to read business news you'll see the markets are moving the markets are doing this the markets are doing that well the market financial markets anyways are just um arenas through which funds move funds flow back and forth basically due to different uh, activities going on in those financial markets and two major aspects of financial markets are primary versus secondary markets and money markets versus capital markets and we'll go over some of the key um, attributes of those markets here. So primary markets are markets in which corporations raise funds through new issues of securities. Uh, that could be bonds or stocks. Um, derivatives come from another area, but uh, mainly bonds and stocks when it comes to corporations. And corporations or government entities sell new financial instrument issues to initial fund suppliers in exchange for funds that the issuer requires. So basically, right, when you're raising money in financial markets as a corporation or a government, because governments do it all the time, you are um, raising funds for something, right? You're raising capital for different purposes. For governments, it's generally kind of day to day spending. For corporations, it um, it can be for all types of things related to the business operations. Um, but um, basically, right, corporations and governments, they decide they need money for some purpose or purposes, and they issue securities through primary markets, and money comes to the corporations or the governments for those various needs. We'll walk through this diagram, uh, just looking at it, it may be a little unclear and vague so i'll try to add some useful uh description to it but the primary markets are essentially investment banks are dealing with um, organizations such corporations primarily that are trying to raise funds for a certain purpose or governments so how it starts out right is the oh, i just turned off my screen by accident so how it starts off is the demanders of funds are the entities that need the funds, um, such as corporations issuing debt, equity instruments, such as bonds or stocks, will work with an underwriter, which is essentially an investment bank. So if you hear about investment banking, um, again, that can be a fairly vague uh, term, like what is investment banking exactly? But basically it's their entities, investment banks that issue cash to uh, corporations and sometimes to governments as well when they need to raise money. And then a security will be transferred to the investment bank. So the stocks or the bonds will be transferred to the investment banks. And then there will be initial suppliers of funds for these securities and investors. And these are often going to be um, big institutional investors that purchase the securities from the investment banks for cash, of course. And as you see, the cash makes its way back to the corporation that's issuing the instrument or the government in some cases. But um, a lot of these initial suppliers of funds are going to be big institutional investors, such as pension plans are a big one. Uh, like Canada Pension Plan has diverse investments in all types of um, instruments and um, different markets. So like an underwriter, an investment bank is doing underwriting for an, uh, an initial offering of debt or equity instruments would often go to 
something like a pension pension fund. There are a lot of big pension funds around the world. In Canada, some examples have been I said CPP, Ontario Teachers Pension Plan is a big one in Ontario. Um, different government employee pension funds as well, and uh, private invest private pension plans also make investments too. So these are the primary markets, right? So keep in mind the primary mar primary market starts with essentially the corporation needing money, and so they'll issue debt or equity instruments such as bonds or stocks. And they'll do that working with an investment bank. Um, the investment bank will initially provide cash to the corporation in exchange for the security. And then the investment bank turns around and sells those securities to other initial investors in exchange for money. And that's typically large institutional investors. It could also be things like hedge funds, uh, other investment banks, etc. So that's the primary market. Secondary markets are what you hear about if you listen to business news or watch business news or read business news. And those are basically the stock exchanges we think about. So like the TSX in Canada or um, the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ in the United States. And it's a centralized marketplace where securities are traded after they've been issued. So the secondary markets are places where all of you and I could go and buy securities bonds, stocks, uh, et cetera. Um, all of us, myself included, and all of you, we wouldn't be able to go and purchase initial offerings because we don't have tens of billions of dollars available for investment, but we certainly could go and purchase um, instruments, financial instruments through the secondary markets quite easily. Any one of us could, and some of you are probably already doing it actually through um, online brokerages and that kind of thing. And so the secondary markets also provide liquidity and diversification benefits for investors because we can go and we can sell our securities if we want to get rid of them for whatever reason maybe they've increased in value enough that we decide okay i want to recover my investment and take the profit i've earned from the security so i'm going to sell it and you can do that very easily in these secondary markets and uh, achieve liquidity very fast um, it's been a while since i've traded stocks because Honestly, I got bored of it, <laughs> but um, it's very quick turnaround. And this was, you know, when I first started trading stocks, it was 20 years ago. Online brokerages were very, um, they were a lot harder to set up. Fees were expensive, but it was fast, right? Like you can go purchase a stock um, in a matter of minutes, as long as you know what you're looking for and what your price range is. And then when you sell it, it's the same thing. You just put in a call, basically an order on the spot market to sell the stocks that you have. You set a range, what you want to sell them for, you know, the minimum, hopefully it goes higher, but somebody will turn around that marketplace and purchase it off you, usually within a matter of hours. So the liquidity is very good. And there's also security valuation information for issuers on these stock markets and stock exchanges and commodities exchanges and other secondary marketplaces that provides um, information to investors about the value of your um, your financial instrument you're holding. There's also um, information for issuers on valuation of securities too. So corporations that are issuing stocks and bonds and what have you. But essentially that's the secondary market. Think of it as when you hear about the financial markets, if you happen to be watching the news or listening to it, you hear about today in the markets, they're talking about secondary markets. They're not talking about these primary markets where um, things are really kind of operating in the background. And um, they're, it's being done with investment banks and large institutional investors, and then the issuers of the various securities. So this is how secondary markets generally work. Um, so you have the financial markets, which would be like the stock exchanges and other um, financial exchanges that we could have access to. Then you have securities brokers and the securities actually go to the brokers and cash goes from the brokers back to the financial markets and makes its way to whoever was holding the, um, the instrument. And then the other suppliers of funds really are all types of investors. It could be retail investors like us, individuals who are just in investing a little bit of money here and there. Uh, it could be institutional investors, it could be you know small, medium, and large investors of all different types. So they purchase securities for cash, and this is just how it flows. And when you think of securities brokers, it could be kind of the sort of classic 
stockbroker um, who you know sits in an office somewhere like a BMO Nest Burns or RBC Dominion Securities or one of these other I guess larger brokerages that a lot of us might be familiar with or Edward Jones or something like that or uh, used to be called Investors Group now it's called something else so those are brokers right and but you can also have online brokers um, and you can also have online brokerages where you do everything yourself. Um, you could work with one individual, you could work with multiple individuals who are securities brokers. It just depends how you set it up. A lot of options there. So keep in mind that the securities brokers, uh, it's not just an individual, you know, sitting behind the computer, taking phone calls to clients. It's actually, you know, online brokerages where you won't have any interaction with an individual at all. Um, there are different uh, setups for securities brokers. And keep in mind too that these other suppliers of funds is pretty much any investor. Right, so us as individuals, groups of investors, corporations, um, institutional ventures like investors like pension funds and hedge funds and things like that. It's a lot of different investors in these secondary markets. And like I said, compared to these primary markets, it's quite different, right? So the primary market is a lot, uh, certainly isn't as big if you were to uh, compare the two in terms of, um, I guess, function and activity, right? There's a lot more activity on these secondary markets, you know, trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars literally moving through these secondary markets every day. Whereas these primary markets are, you know, in the billions of dollars and there aren't a whole bunch of investors um, who can really access the initial offerings to these primary markets that we see here, right? So keep in mind, these are like institutional investors, think of pension funds, hedge funds, governments, those types of things. And secondary markets is the rest of us, so us individuals, plus everybody else dealing with brokers, whether that's, you know, a virtual broker online where we do it all ourselves, or an actual person who is our um, go-to expert for investing that we might work with. And the financial markets and secondary markets, keep in mind, those are things like the stock exchanges. So uh, money markets versus capital markets. Um, money markets are markets where debt securities or instruments with maturities of less than one year are traded. Um, so they're basically they're liquid and considered uh, the same as cash if you're dealing with money markets. Capital markets trade debt and, debt and equity instruments with maturities greater than one year. So this is pretty much everything else. Um, you'll see as we go on here, money markets are fairly straightforward actually. And it's a little easier to say what's in the money markets versus what isn't <laughs> money markets is basically cash and government treasury bills um, that uh, have a short maturity or i guess in some cases too could be bonds that have a short maturity of up to one year the capital markets will be notes and bonds and then stocks and equities that have maturity of greater than one year or actually no maturity like stocks don't pardon me stocks don't have a maturity for instance um, and you know some people do buy them to trade them quickly, but most people who are getting into stocks are getting into it for a long term, one year or longer. And so there's a long list of money market instruments. I won't touch on all of them, or perhaps I will. I'll touch on most of them. Treasury bills are the big ones in money markets. Um, this the examples in here are U.S., but the Canadian government issues treasury bills as well, and. Um, it's basically the same as cash very quickly very quickly converted from the treasury bill into cash um offer very low interest rates because they are very secure like you know the u.s government or the canadian government is going to pay you the money for your treasury bill when you cash it in. and there are governments around the world where you don't know that but for most of the so-called western world um western europe north america a lot of um, uh, other countries as well, they, you know that T-bills are secure. The governments are stable enough and they maintain um, good financial discipline. So generally a treasury bill is a very secure, um, risk-free uh, investment in the money market. But keep in mind it's short term and you're not gonna make any money off it because it's essentially risk-free. Then you have other things like federal funds, repurchase agreements, commercial paper, certificates of deposit that can be negotiated, bankers acceptances. So these are all money market instruments because the maturity is less than a year. 
treasury notes and bonds can be issued by the government as well. Um, in our case, in Canada, it's done by the federal government. Some of the provincial governments issue treasury notes and bonds as well. Um, like Ontario is a big one. Pretty much all provinces issue bonds. Uh, and of course, state governments in the US, government agency bonds, um, state and local government bonds. There's a lot of governments that issue bonds. Mortgages. So when we say mortgages, it's um, mortgages are uh, capitalized different than other instruments. And um, mortgages are basically traded in the capital market as well. And mortgage-backed securities. So those are long-term securities, debt securities that um, offer expected principal and interest payments as collateral. And those come from mortgages because with mortgages, we know what the interest payments are, what the principal payments are going to be for um, a long period of time. So we can back securities by that. And a lot of securities are backed by mortgages. So mortgages raise, um, money's raised for mortgages in these money markets and capital markets. And um, it's done differently than other securities, just to keep in mind. Corporate bonds, of course, and corporate stocks. So those are, there are many different types of instruments we can access on the money markets and the capital markets. Some other markets are foreign exchange markets, which are very busy, lots of volume because of um, all the trade that, tra that goes on around the world and all the different currencies being used. And so foreign exchange markets is just where you trade currencies for immediate or some future state of delivery. So the spot market, when you hear that, that's immediate trade and delivery. So if I, I can go in, I don't have an account for foreign exchange anymore. I used to, I could go in and say I want to buy euros or British pounds. I could go do that on the spot market. And I basically just have money available in my account and I purchase so many British pounds, say a thousand. Um, and that happens pretty much instantly, but you can also buy what are called um, options to purchase them in the future at a given price. So there's a lot of that going on in foreign exchange markets and all, actually all markets. Here are what you hear of the options you'll hear about and we'll talk about those a bit later on in the class. Foreign exchange risk, um, of course, is a constant, um, a constant concern, I suppose. I was trying to think, of, it may not always be a concern, but um, companies and individuals that do business internationally in more than one currency always face foreign exchange risk. So a lot of companies will actually um, hedge their foreign exchange risk by constantly carrying a fairly diverse basket of um, foreign currencies. Uh, one simple example of how people people do that as individuals, right, is we have all these snowbirds in Canada that go down to warm places in the United States for a good chunk of the winter. Um, and you'll see most banks offer a U.S. dollar account, whether it's savings, checkings, whatever the case may be. And really that's catering to the snowbirds, right? And it, it also to people who do business in the States and travel there for business. But I would guess there are a lot more snowbirds <laughs> doing um, exchanging money. So you can eliminate some foreign exchange risk and some cost by doing things like if you travel to the States frequently, putting money into a US dollar account with your bank, and you're gonna get a better price on the exchange rate than you are doing it on, um, uh, doing it when you need to spend the money. As one example, I know people that um, go down to the States quite a bit and they just use their, virtual credit card that is a part of their interact debit card from their bank account and so they have canadian money in their account and they go to the states and they just use that card like a regular credit card and the conversion happens instantaneously right when you make a purchase for 100 dollars us um, somewhere in the states and it's your canadian money is instantly converted into us dollars but the big thing, I don't know if any of you have done that. I know some people who do this quite a bit and uh, I keep telling them, get a US dollar account, put money in that account and use the US dollar account when you go to the States, quit you know, just using your virtual credit card that's hooked up to your Canadian dollar debit card because you're gonna pay additional fees when you do that. And you, you will, right? Because the bank charges you for the convenience of being able to convert that cash from Canadian dollars to US dollars instantly while you're sitting at a cash register 
at some business in the United States. So I highly recommend you don't do that, right? If you're one of these people that travels, plan on getting um, a bank account in US currency, you can do it in Canada. You could also exchange currency before you travel too. Uh, not as convenient, but certainly you're gonna end up spending less because foreign exchange, it, these markets are always moving, right? If you watch the foreign exchange markets, they run up and down continuously for all kinds of reasons. And uh, they fluctuate so much that people actually make money just trading throughout the day in markets like this. There's so much volume going through there, even small changes in the, in the exchange rate. If you play it right, you can make money if you're doing, doing it high volume. Other things in here of our derivative securities. Um, I always tell people when I'm talking financial markets, uh, you need to watch, um, uh, of course, I forget the name of the movie, The Big Short. It's an old movie. It's called The Big Short. Uh, I believe it's still on Netflix. Uh, Brad Pitt, Steve Carell, a few other big, uh, big name actors are in it. And basically it's about the 2008 financial crisis and how it happened and why. Uh, based on a true story, uh, pretty accurate. Uh, I love this movie. I've read about it plenty of times, but it does a very good job of just explaining financial markets and what derivatives are. And a derivative security is basically anything that isn't the typical securities we think of. Uh, when we think of stocks, bonds, um, T-bills, commodities, though none of those are derivatives. A derivative is just a different type of security um, that's done through an agreement between two parties or more. And really it's just done to exchange a standard quantity of some asset at a predetermined price, a specified date in the future. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of other examples, but there's so many examples of derivatives. If you really want to understand a derivative and you have some time on your hands, I honestly uh, watch the big short. It gives you a really good explanation of, of uh, the derivative markets. But uh, derivatives are generally highly leveraged financial securities linked to some other security. Uh, a lot of them can be high risk, um, and a lot of them are used for hedging and for speculating. So hedging, is, for those of you who don't know, is when you try to balance out various kinds of risk and reduce that risk by purchasing different types of instruments. So when we buy insurance for our vehicle as individuals, that's kind of like a hedge. Um, that's sort of like hedging, but uh, not exactly the same, but just to give you an example. Um, Another hedge would be, let's say, um, oh, I do business, I have a business and I export a lot of uh, my goods to the European Union. So I'm going to have to do a lot of business in euros um, to try and offset that foreign exchange risk. I can hedge by constantly trading euros. I could also buy um, other foreign currencies apart from euros that behave slightly differently than the euro. So as the euro goes up, I could buy a currency that um, um, behaves differently to try and hedge against it. There's quite a bit of um, um, work that goes into hedging. It's something that has to be continuously done. When you hear about treasury management in uh, big corporations, that's a lot of what they're doing is dealing with hedging uh, foreign currency risk and foreign exchange risk. And they're even often using derivatives to try and hedge some of these different risks that they face in the financial markets. Um, the financial institutions, um, I mean, we all deal with them all the time. Uh, of course, they perform essential functions of channeling funds from those with surplus funds to those with shortage of funds. So, you know, basically financial institutions are just getting funds from one source and moving it to another source that needs it. That's really all they're doing. Right? That's what your bank is doing. Um, your bank's getting money from people who have it and lending it to people who need it. Um, and it's just moving money around. That's essentially what financial institutions are doing. Um, so we have banks, thrifts, insurance companies do a lot, are actually financial institutions and they deal with money a lot and they do a lot of investing. Mutual funds um, are another area that are very common. Um, and we talked about that a bit, I think. In previous classes, um, some of the economic functions performed by financial institutions that are unique to financial institutions are monitoring. So financial institutions act as delegated monitors um, or economic agents appointed to act on behalf of smaller investors in collecting information and or investing funds on their behalf. 
So uh, if you want to get economic data, as one example, um, the big banks are good sources of information for economic data. Um, broken down by province, major cities, and metropolitan areas, other countries, uh, by industries, etc. So that would be an example of being a delegated monitor is all the big banks have uh, professional economists and financial analysts whose whole job is to basically look at the marketplace and look at economies and make um, draw some conclusions and issue some reports about what's going on. So they do this for investors and they do this for people investing all types of uh, instruments such as the stock markets, bonds, etc. but also looking to see what's happening with certain industries. Um, so that's not something that financial institutions are required to do. It's something that they do uh, basically as a service and to provide, um, to entice people to work with them essentially. But they also do it for themselves too, right? So they have to, they're playing in the financial markets and they're active in them as well. So they need analysis, good analysis and data on a constant, continuing basis. Some other things that uh, financial institutions do is they can handle liquidity and price risk. Um, so I like this, this term, they act as asset transformers by purchasing the financial claims that fund users issue and then financing the purchase by selling secondary securities to household investors. So that's just um, <laughs> kind of a roundabout and long-winded way of saying they convert uh, assets to cash and cash to assets. Um, financial institutions do that, right? And they have the, the infrastructure to do that. So all of us, um, it's a little bit more time consuming for us to convert cash into assets and assets to cash, depending on what type of uh, assets we're dealing with, particularly with financial instruments and capital market instruments. Um, we can all do these things, but we always have to uh, end up working with a financial institution in some shape or form. Um, and if we want to get securities, secondary securities, we can go and do that from the bank. We can even sell those at the bank in some cases, right? Uh, depend, every bank has their own mutual funds that they deal with. And most of the time, they're not as good as other mutual funds. But uh, you can go to your bank, you can buy a mutual fund, you can turn around and sell it. Um, so that's basically what asset transformation is, just to use a simple example. And um, it's a big function of financial institutions and funds are <laughs> flowing in many ways when it comes to financial institutions. So you have users of funds, suppliers of funds on the right side, financial institution brokers and asset transformers. Uh, the cash is moving from suppliers of funds to the financial institutions and then to the users of funds. Um, these financial claims down in the bottom left you see here with the arrows coming from users of funds to financial financial institutions. So these financial claims are basically just equity and debt securities, right? When you own a stock, you have a financial claim to a piece of ownership in that company that it's issued from. If you own a bond, you have a claim to um, the face value of that bond plus any coupon payment that it might be paying. So that's what's meant by these claims. Uh, on the right-hand side with the financial claims, deposits and insurance policies. So this is uh, as individuals and retailing I was going to say retail investors and also retail, um, trying to think of the word, retail bankers, right? Retail banking is personal banking that most of us do. So we have financial claims to deposits that we would put into any account we have with the financial institution. We own that money, right? That's our money, not the bank's money, <laughs> that we have a claim to any deposit we have in an account, whether it's uh, cash in a checking account or a mutual fund that is issued by that particular financial institution, but also there's insurance policies too. So when we're talking about this, it's mainly life insurance, but also other types of non-typical retail insurance. So if you have a certain type of life insurance policy, you have a claim to some amount of money besides the uh, payout benefit for that life insurance policy. I'm talking about things like whole life and universal life you might have heard of it commercials and what have you. Um, we actually have a financial claim to a cash value on that policy, depending on the type of policy it is. And that's held by financial institutions like the insurance company. So it's just to give you an idea of how this uh, system flows back and forth. Um, 
interest rates and vulnerable funds. We'll talk a lot. Well, you'll be working with interest rates a lot in this class and in any finance class. Um, I love this. The interest rate is a myth, and that's true, right? There is no the interest rate. There are many interest rates, and we're usually talking in nominal interest rates, and those are observed in financial markets and most often quoted by financial news services. So you'll hear about the bank rate or the prime lending rate, or you'll hear about mortgage rates going up. So there's no one rate, right? Like right there, I've given you three different interest rates that you're going to hear about in financial news or business news. The bank rate is what uh, the Bank of Canada, the rate that they charge to chartered banks to borrow money from the Bank of Canada. The prime rate is what the bank charges to the lowest risk borrower of their funds. So the lowest rate that they'll, they'll offer. And then mortgage rates are actually completely different than those other rates. Uh, mortgage rates are affected by bond markets. So that's how, um, and mutual fund markets, because that's how uh, companies earn money to issue mortgages. So there is no single interest rate. <laughs> there are many of them. And um, we're always talking nominal rates, which you'll see a little bit ahead here, what, what I mean by that. Um, there's nominal rates and then I guess real rates, but you'll see probably about four or five slides from now. The loanable funds theory is a theory that views equilibrium interest rates in financial markets as a result of the supply of and demand for loanable funds. And to show you that, so when it comes to loanable funds, it really is um, a classic example of supply and demand. So demand is the blue curve, supply is the red curve. So this is the supply of funds that can be loaned out. Demand for the funds is uh, decreasing as the amount of funds available to be loaned out um, increase. As interest rates rise, the uh, supply for funds is gonna be increasing somewhat, but uh, the quantity of, lo uh, uh, of loanable funds demanded is gonna decrease. So um, I'm trying to think of some other examples. Uh, right now, there's a lot of talk about inflation, for instance, in a lot of parts of the world, but you hear about it all the time in the news in Canada because our inflation is very high right now. And it's not just us, it's happening all over the place, um, predominantly because of uh, issues in um, um, logistics and supply chains being slow, slowed down due to this pandemic. But um, so some people will say when inflation starts to get too high, uh, central banks will generally raise interest rates because that'll decrease the demand for. Um, for money, right? So if interest rates go up, I'm gonna start rethinking, taking out a new car loan, right? If all of a sudden interest rates for a vehicle loan go from 6% to eight or 9%, that can make a big difference. Or if mortgage rates go up, that's a good example. I'm gonna start thinking about my mortgage, right? And locking in a lower rate if possible, different things like that. Um, basically, as the interest rate goes up, the demand decreases and the um, demand for other for products and services that we use those funds for will all also decrease. That's like with typical inflation, right? So when you come out of a recession, that's often a problem. We had a big recession last year, pretty much all over the world because of this pandemic. And so central banks have been pretty cautious about interest rates. They certainly haven't been lowering them. Lowering them. There's a lot of talk about them going up, but um, that hasn't happened in the case of Canada yet or in the United States, I think. But when those interest rates do go up, when the central banks raise their, their bank rate, what's going to happen is the demand for loans is going to start to decrease, right? Um, so what that's going to do is create, it, it's going to lower the money supply that's available in the economy. Whereas right now, the money supply is pretty high because interest rates are, are quite low. And so it's easy to access loans right now. And because of that, we have... <laughs> we, some of us, <laughs> businesses and individuals have access to more money that they can borrow. Uh, they borrow money from banks and financial institutions and they turn around and they buy things with it, right? Goods and services that can contribute to inflation. So um, just keep in mind with the supply and demand for, inter for loanable funds and interest rates, it's your typical supply and demand, for, right? As the cost, which is the interest, as the cost of loans goes up, demand is gonna decrease. Supply will increase, but 
I mean, financial institutions aren't going to increase supply to the far right top corner of this graph because no one's going to be borrowing that money at these high interest rates, right? So that's one of the reasons why just getting back to my little discussion there on inflation, that's why central banks will raise interest rates when inflation is uh, due to demand and um, it's not expected to, inflation isn't expected to decrease without action from a central bank just because of this inverse relationship, right? As the price of the loan goes up, we're gonna borrow less. As the price of the loan goes down, so the interest rate is lower, we're gonna to wanna to borrow more, as you'll see from the demand curve. Um, there are a lot of things that affect differences in interest rates. Um, I was just trying to think of some examples. So I gave you inflation. Inflation certainly affects interest rates. Um, real risk-free rates affect interest rates. We'll talk about that a bit in a few slides. Default risk, of course, increases uh, or affects interest rate. So if any of you have ever got a, um, or a lot of you probably have a credit card, right? And most credit cards are a very high interest rate and that's due to the default risk. So you may be a low risk for defaulting on your credit card, but there are a lot of people who default on credit cards. So that's why you see the interest rate so high and they're also unsecured uh, for the most part. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples of default risk. Um, high interest lenders, I guess would be another example. So uh, you see these commercials here and there or advertisements on social media for things like Easy Financial, that is a high interest lender. And the reason the interest rate is high is because the default risk is higher for their clients. So they cater to people who are um, higher risk in terms of borrowing money. And then you have the inverse, right? When default risk is low. So if I have really great credit, that's, and my credit score is really strong, that is an indicator that my risk of defaulting on a loan or any type of credit I have is gonna be low. My interest rates are gonna come down because my default risk is low. So as default risk increases, interest rates increase. As default risk decreases, interest rates decrease. Liquidity risk is uh, the risk associated with being able to convert assets to cash and um, also being able to uh, access assets, I guess, quickly. Special provisions regarding the use of funds raised by a particular security issuer. Um, I'm to, there's so many examples of this. These are what we call covenants. So, um, when a lot of times when you borrow money for uh, anything, there's going to be certain conditions associated with it, particularly in business. And that's what this is talking about. Special provisions regarding the use of funds raised by a particular security issuer. So uh, for a lot of business loans, particularly when they get to um, amounts in the million dollar range and higher, there'll be what are called covenants on there or conditions or caveats. And that's, you know, having to maintain certain financial um, ratio targets and that kind of thing, but also keeping debt under a certain amount, having so much cash on hand. There's a lot of examples of uh, these special provisions, but these things affect interest rates as well. So, you know, if um, I have a business and I go get a million dollar loan from, from a bank, um, and a special provision might be added that will keep my interest rate low. So I, one of those things might be, I have to have $100,000 cash on hand at any given point, right? Under this loan to get this million dollars and to keep it at a low interest rate. It's just another example of special provisions. And there's, it's really kind of anything under the sun. There are a lot of, opportunity, there are a lot of different uh, examples of that. And of course the securities term to maturity also affects interest rates. So essentially the longer the period is to maturity, the higher the interest rate is going to be. Because as you go into the future, further and further, risk becomes greater and greater. Because really none of us know what's gonna to happen tomorrow when you think about it. And we certainly don't know what's gonna happen a year from now or 10 years from now or 20 years from now, right? So if you think about the risk of you not knowing where I'm gonna be 10 years from now, um, that's gonna affect interest rates for a lot of reasons. So you'll see with uh, longer term mortgages, longer term loans, the interest rates will be higher than shorter term ones, everything else being equal, of course.
but uh, these are just some of the specific variables that affect interest rates. Inflation, uh, I've talked about it um, a few times in this class and I babble about it a lot because it's in the news all the time and we haven't had inflation this high um, as long as I can remember, probably not since the 1990s, I think. But inflation is just the continual increase in the price level of a standardized basket of goods and services. So when we talk about inflation in Canada or in the States, we're using what's called the consumer price index, which is just a, a standard basket of goods and services. And they look at the price over different periods of time. And that's how they, they that's how inflation is calculated. Um, in the case of Canada, it'll be like Stats Canada looks at inflation and reports on it. You can also use different measures too, but the CPI, again, it's a standardized basket. So you're always comparing the same uh, basket of goods and services over time. Um, to use that cliche, right? You're comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges when you use something like the CPI. So when you hear about inflation going up, inflation being 4% in the month of August, I think it was four and a half, something like that in August, they're always looking at a year beforehand and comparing the price of that CPI basket of goods and services from basically a year ago to today. And um, another thing to keep in mind with inflation is over time, inflation really reduces the value of your dollar, right? So if you take a hundred bucks, a hundred dollar bill, and you stick it under your mattress for a year, uh, keep in mind time value of money is in plays comes into play too. But if I stick a hundred dollar bill under my mattress and I leave it there for a year, in a year's time, it's going to be worth quite a bit less because more inflation is at right now. Even if inflation were normal, which is in that two percent range, that uh, most governments uh, in the West have targeted over about the past 30 years is around a 2% annual inflation rate. Even at 2% inflation, that $100 is going to be worth less a year from now tucked under your mattress than it is if you go and invest it somewhere to earn interest on it or spend it on something that uh, is useful. Um, the risk-free rate, you'll start to hear about that. And a real risk-free rate is just the rate that a risk-free security would pay if no inflation were expected over its holding period. So we, you'll hear this in questions from time to time. Just keep in mind what that is. Uh, the Fisher effect is a relationship among risk -free, real risk-free rates, expected inflation, and nominal risk-free rates. Um, sounds confusing, but it's actually pretty straightforward, and you will need to know this formula and use it, like know how to use it. Um, you can use formula sheets when you are doing quizzes and exams. Uh, so you can have a formula like this written down on that sheet, but you need to know how to use it, right? So the real, the relationship amongst real risk-free rates is RFR equals I minus the expected inflation. So that's the bottom part of the equation. The top is the interest rate, the nominal risk-free rates is equal to the expected inflation, which is this expected IP, plus the real risk-free rate, or RFR. So you'll see questions where they'll tell you what inflation is, and they'll tell you what the nominal risk-free rate is, and you'll have to calculate the real risk-free rate, which is the bottom part of the equation. That's kind of the one you'll see often. But you'll also see questions where they'll give you the nominal risk-free rate, the I and the real risk-free rate, the RFR, and you'll be need to calculate expected inflation, but it's just a basic um, adding and subtracting equation, right? So you're gonna see that come up and you're gonna see questions where you're not given the rate you need to use to do something like a time value of money calculation. You'll have to do this equation first and then figure out what your discount is, rate is based on an equation like this. So you only have partial information. So you're going to see that coming up on the next assignment. Um, not the one that's due next week, the one after that. I think the next assignment is just chapter four and five. Um, so this is the relationship or a relationship between nominal interest rates versus inflation. So the CPI, the orange line is the inflation rate because that's the consumer price index. The blue line is the T-bill rate. So the treasury bill rate and treasury bills, again, are issued by governments. So you'll notice the difference between the nominal risk-free rate and the change in CPI over the last several decades. And this is going back almost 60, well, it is going back 60 years, right? So 
essentially as inflation changes, the T-bill rate is going to change too. You see how they're pretty much tied together. I mean, they, they're not equal and they're not supposed to be, but there's definitely a um, strong relationship between the two. And uh, it's just been in the past little while where you see inflation is actually quite a bit higher than the uh, T-bill rate. But there was a period where the T-bill rate in the 1990s was actually higher than the CPI. So I remember taking finance, my first finance class, and that's where we were right around here, around 1998. And so you could actually protect yourself from inflation if you're going to save money just by putting it into T-bills. Whereas today, you're not going to, right? Inflation is quite a bit higher. And it's even worse now. This graph only goes up to 2018. Um, inflation is a much higher than the T-bill rate. But generally, they're closely linked. Well, we talked about default risk a little bit earlier. Um, and... So that's the risk of the security issuer will default on that security by being late on a payment or missing an interest or principal payment. Um, and if there's a higher risk of default, investors demand higher interest be paid, right? And that's just to basically account for that risk of not getting paid what you're supposed to be getting paid. And treasury securities, not just US, but Canadian treasury securities from the federal government, they're generally considered to be free of default risk. And this is just uh, the default risk is the interest rate for um, uh, expected minus the interest rate that you'd be that's being paid. And so let's calculate the premium on risk, default risk. Uh, this is a good example of how default risk affects interest rates. So the AAA at the top is the AAA at the top is like a really strong bond issued by a highly rated bond uh, with lower risk of default. Um, and then BAA is a more risky bond uh, with a greater risk of default. So you're going to see lower interest rates on the AAA bond, which is the orange line, because there's less default risk. And you're going to see higher interest rates being paid on the BAA risk or the BAA bond because um, there's a higher degree of default, or there's a higher chance of default risk. So that's why you see the interest rate in blue being higher than in uh, orange. And that's the premium that you're paying. So on the same, on the same $1 invested in bonds between these two companies, there's a default premium being paid by the BAA. Uh, we mentioned liquidity risk briefly, and uh, that's the risk that a security cannot be sold at a fair market price with low transaction costs on short notice. So I had an example here. I just wondered if I should go into it. Um, when I first started online trading like 20 years ago, um, it was fairly, it was fast to, to trade online through online brokerages, uh, but it was expensive. The transaction costs were very high. Um, that's changed quite a bit over the years as um, technology's improved and more and more people are doing online training, that kind of thing. And people just got tired of paying exorbitant costs for um, converting their stocks into cash. But that essentially that's what liquidity risk is, right? How easy is it to sell security to fair market price with a low transaction cost on short notice? So today, um, I'd pay much less to sell 100 shares of any stock I might hold through my um, online brokerage account. And I'd have that cash within 24 hours, probably a lot sooner. And uh, the transaction costs are gonna be a little bit lower and uh, getting a fair market price, well, it's done on an exchange. So you are gonna get a fair market price. So the liquidity risk is low in that case, but there are some more, I guess, specialized investments and by specialized, I mean, they're just not being traded as much or they're not as liquid where the liquidity risk is gonna be higher. And the interest rate on the security does reflect its relative liquidity. So highly liquid assets carry the lowest interest rates. Uh, think of the T-bills, a T-bill, if you buy T-bills, you, you essentially have cash, the interest rate is very low 
because um, they are very liquid. So that's one reason why the interest rates are so low for T-bills. If a security is illiquid, so it's hard to sell it at a fair market price with low transaction costs on short notice, that'd be like a house you own. If you own a house, uh, it's difficult to sell it at a fair market price on short notice with low transaction costs. Um, so if the security is illiquid, investors will add a liquidity risk premium to the interest rate as well. Um, I'm trying to think of some examples of that, but I can't offhand apart from the, the uh, purchase and selling of a house, which isn't done in financial markets. Um, special provisions that, um, special provisions in term to maturity. So a securities issuing party may attach special provisions or covenants to the security issued, and these provisions affect the interest rates. So there could be covenants impacting taxability, convertibility, and callability. Callability is um, the ability for um, the holder of the security. So if I hold a bond, callability is the ability for me to just turn around and sell it back to the issuer, or for the issuer to say, okay, we're calling the bond because we have money to pay it off early. Um, convertibility is converting a uh, security into another type of security. So you can, you'll often hear of things called convertible debentures, which is just a fancy way of saying a, a debt, like a bond or a note payable that can be converted into equity shares. Um, that's an example of convertibility and taxability. There are a number of things that affect that. There are many examples too, depends on the security, how it's held, where it's held, like in terms of um, the type of account it's held in, or the geography where it's held, all kinds of things impact the taxability. The term structure of interest rates or the yield curve, it's a comparison of market yields on securities, assuming all characteristics except maturity are equal. And I can't remember if we have an example, but we don't. Um, there are several yield curve theories, so you'll need to have an understanding of them for um, assignments and quizzes and exams. The unbiased expectations theory is at any given point in time, the yield curve reflects the market's current expectations of future short-term rates. The liquidity premium theory it holds that investors will hold long-term maturities only if these securities with longer-term maturities are offered at a premium to compensate for future uncertainty in the securities value. So because we have to hold it longer term, we're gonna expect that the interest rates are going to be higher to compensate for that future uncertainty, right? Back to my earlier example of we don't actually know what's going to happen tomorrow any more than we know what's going to happen 10 years from now, you know? So in 10 years from now, it actually gets worse, <laughs> right? The, the unknown factor just increases. So we want to be compensated for that as investors. Uh, market segmentation theory says that individual investors and financial institutions have specific maturity preferences and convincing them to hold securities with maturities other than their most preferred requires a higher interest rate. So these are all related because they all affect interest rates. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example, market segmentation. Um, one example of this, so a lot of um, uh, uh, banks and financial institutions, when if they lend you money and you're using as collateral uh, stocks, uh, so you have a stock portfolio of $100,000. Um, most banks, they are going to, if you have $100,000 in stocks, most banks are, and you're going to use it as collateral, most banks are only going to accept a portion of that $100,000 as collateral. And one of the reasons for that is because of, you know, changes in stock values, right? So banks are very conservative in Canada in particular. And by that, I mean, they don't like to take a lot of risks. So if I go to the bank and I say, okay, well, I want to get a loan. I have $100,000 in stocks in my um, various investment accounts that I'm going to use as collateral. What kind of deal can you give me? One of the first things most banks are going to do is they're only going to look at 50% of the value of that stock portfolio. And it's a little bit ridiculous, um, but it is what it is. So that's an example of um, individual investors and financial institutions having specific maturity preferences. Um, because the stock doesn't mature for one thing and it just keeps going on and on forever and a lot of things affect its price. But um, there are other, other things to consider too. So 
they have the most preferred <laughs> for banks if you go and take a loan, uh, just carry on to the same example. If you go and take a loan, you have collateral. Uh, the most preferred collateral would be residential real estate in a pretty stable market where prices haven't dropped. Um, cash in the bank, uh, GICs, um, certain types of bonds like government bonds and AAA rated bonds, those types of things they will uh, they like to see being used as collateral. So if I go in with $100,000 bonds, $100,000 worth of government Canada bonds as collateral, they're going to take, the bank's going to take every dollar of that as collateral because uh, it's a government Canada bond. There's essentially no risk that the value of that bond is going to decrease or that it's not going to be paid out, that sort of thing. Whereas with the stocks, they're going to, rather than offering or charging me a higher interest rate by using my stocks as collateral, what they're going to do is they're just going to devalue my portfolio or they could charge a higher interest rate too but that's essentially what market segmentation is and forecasting interest rates um, is tricky but it's done all the time and it can be done as this as interest rates rise the value of investment portfolios of individual corporations will fall resulting in a loss of wealth and we can use what's called the unbiased expectations theory to forecast short-term interest rates into the future so we can do one year two years three years as long as we have some future interest rate available to us we can do it and by future i mean so a long-term interest rate so if you know what the interest rate is for a 10-year loan or a 10-year mortgage and i know what the current interest rate is i could use this unbiased expectations theory formula to forecast um, an interest rate at some period between them. Now, it's not necessarily going to be accurate. Uh, like by accurate, I mean it's not going to be 100% accurate because there are a lot of. Um, just a second here. Yeah, so you'll use some of this in the assignment. Um, make sure to read the portion in the uh, textbook about this. Uh, there are also some really good, concise online articles that explain this really well. This um, unbiased expectations theory. Um, and I think that's it for today. Yep. Let me stop recording.